yes, he had had a relationship of, of six years with the employee uh, in question, but that she would have already, she had always been fine with it until she was about to be fired. In the third case, at a judge's chamber, a judge collects his belongings, having resigned amid allegations that he visited an adult website on a government computer, spent $3,000, for which he couldn't account, at a local strip club, having, a name that appear, having his name appear on a prostitution ring's client list, and about having asked the prostitute to mislead investigators. And in a fourth judge's chamber, a little less active a judge's chamber by comparison, the ju a judge is enmeshed in an ethics controversy over whether he could preside over an obscenity trial, given the fact that he posted graphic images on, per on a personal website. Now, is all this a Scott Turow novel gone terribly wrong? Or is it the uh, fever imaginings of a journalist forced to spend the night at the Mayflower Hotel, the same hotel that brought Elliot Spitzer to the room? <laughs> No, the stories are all too real, and the characters at the center of these stories are federal judges, respectively, U.S. District Judge Thomas Borges of New Orleans, U.S. District Judge Samuel Kent of Houston, U.S. District Judge Edward Nottingham of Denver, and U.S. Circuit Court Judge Alex Kaczynski in San Francisco. Now, it's been left to this journalist to lay out the ugly details at the center of all of this topic. Yet for each personal and professional tragedy, there are larger issues uh, that, that are posed. Uh, issues about the ability of the judicial branch to police itself, the public's right to know, and the judge's right to, and a judge's right to privacy in, the, in these cases. And we've got the panel to discuss that. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel, uh, starting with Dennis Jacob, who is the Chief Judge of the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the, se for the Second Circuit. Uh, he has served as Chief Judge there. Uh, he was nominated by President George H.W. Bush in 1992. As Chairman of the the Judicial Resources Committee of the United States Judicial Conference, he oversaw the implementation of the Employee Dispute Resolution Program uh, for the Third Branch. Arthur Hellman is a professor of law at the University of Pittsburgh Law School. He's one of the nation's leading authorities on judicial ethics. Uh, he contributed to the the crafting of the Judicial Improvement Act of 2002, which is the legislation that guides the handling of misconduct, of investigations of misconduct by federal judges. Finally, Judge Charles, excuse me, finally, Ch Ch Professor Charles Jay is a professor of law at the University of Indiana School of Law in Bloomington. He is also the author of When Courts and Congress Collide, and a co-author of Judicial Conduct and Ethics. We'll begin today with Judge Jacobs. Thank you. Well, to, uh, to set the parameters and to provide a frame of reference, I've been asked to set out the mechanism for the discipline of federal judges prescribed by the statute by the judicial conference rules and by practice, and to give a short history of how these rules developed over time. Uh, I claim my expertise in this because as chief judge of the circuit, uh, this is part of what I do for a living. This panel will, I think, demonstrate that this is no mere esoteric internal court procedure. This subject reflects broadly on the world of judges, and in particular, judges as powers within their own courtrooms and judicial officers resolving controversies, judges as players in government jockeying for their own independence from the other branches, 
Judges and citizens active in public life, albeit in certain limited respects. Judges as the cultural paragons that the popular imagination would seek to make for us. And judges as ordinary victims of disease and uh, declining powers as we serve our life sentences in office. <laughs> the disciplinary rules give uh, insight into the nature of our judiciary and the idea of a judge in our country. Until recently, this subject was treated internally, informally, and quietly, exclusively, and without publicity. Uh, as my fellow panelist Arthur Hellman has pointed out in an article, impeachment was, until recent days, the only available formal mechanism for effective judicial discipline, and that is something of a blunt instrument. In 1980, however, uh, Congress implemented procedures for judicial discipline and entrusted the administration to the judicial councils, composed of judges uh, that had been created in 1939 for the administration of each of the circuits. But this was a decentralized approach and it had its virtues, but in the mid-80s, uh, a committee composed of chief circuit judges sought to achieve more consistency. Uh, and they formulated the illustrative rules governing judicial misconduct and disability, together with detailed commentary, uh, which were adopted with minor modifications by all of the judicial councils. Congressional interest in this subject, which was never dormant, um, uh, became overt and insistent uh, in 2001 uh, with hearings and reform legislation and reached uh, some sort of high point when the chair of the House Judiciary Committee introduced the bill in 2006 uh, to create the office of an uh, inspector general for the third branch. Uh, by then, however, Chief Justice Rehnquist had appointed a committee to conduct a sweeping review of the performance of the judiciary in policing its own misconduct and to make recommendations to remedy uh, shortcomings and abuses. Um, that committee, uh, appointed in 2004, was chaired by Justice Breyer. Uh, and this extensive and delicate work was carried out with thoroughness and dispatch. Um, the Breyer Committee report issued in September 2006. Uh, virtually all of the committee's recommendations were later implemented in our present rules for judicial conduct and judicial disability proceedings, which were promulgated by the Judicial Conference of the United States this past March. Uh, so now, for the first time, we have uniform national standards across all the circuits, and we're all doing the same thing as part of the same project. Um, probably too early to evaluate exactly how well we're doing. What constitutes misconduct under the statute? The statutory definition is conduct prejudicial to the effectiveness, to the effective and expeditious administration of the business of the courts. So now you know. <laughs> Rule 3H lists some examples of cognizable misconduct. Um, you can probably download that from uh, the, uh, the CD ROM. As the rules explain, the statute and the code of conduct for U.S. judges are not intended to be coextensive. Not every violation of the code of conduct amounts to judicial misconduct. Uh, for example, failure to recuse, absence of illicit or nefarious purpose. Uh, ordinary is considered merits related and is therefore dismissible under the statute. Likewise, conflict of interest based on financial holdings is not a focus of misconduct rules. Uh, many of the code violations here are minor and inadvertent, and corporate mergers and metamorphoses uh, have made it difficult to know what assets one is holding, assuming one has any left. <laughs> <laughs> and in any event, automated conflict checking will make this issue go away. Um, what's the volume of what we're talking about? About seven, uh, roughly 700 uh, uh, judicial uh, misconduct and, and disability complaints are filed every year, and over 650 of them are uh, summarily dismissed by the, the uh, chief judges on one basis or another. In the Second Circuit, uh, I received about uh, one complaint a week, probably a little more than that, in the last five years. Uh, the Chief Judge of the Second Circuit has appointed only three special committees uh, to look into uh, allegations. These are not really large numbers, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the small number of committees appointed to look into potentially serious matters, um, I feel provides limited assurance 
Uh, because many lawyers will naturally be reluctant to report instances of misconduct or disability. Uh, the bar associations uh, may form committees to present complaints and thereby preserve the anonymity of individual lawyers and give uh, uh, safety to numbers. Uh, but such reports are highly unusual, at least uh, in the Second Circuit. Accordingly, one recommendation of the bar report is that the Chief Circuit judges should more frequently inquire, so is Fontaine, um, and then to appoint a committee to look into misconduct or disability when the chief judge becomes aware of it from any source, regardless of whether a complaint has been registered. The statute lists uh, several grounds for summary dismissal by the chief judge, which are also laid out in Rule 11C, which you can download. The most frequently cited ground for dismissal is that the complaint directly relates to the merits of a decision or a procedural rule. Um, the statute does not prohibit or penalize error in the course of proceedings or hearings or trials or appeals. Uh, it's often thought that the statute excludes consideration of judicial acts that are merits related because such acts can always be taken up on appeal. Uh, and while it's generally true that merits related to this conduct can be rectified on appeal, there are acts that can be corrected on appeal that are nevertheless are the proper subject of judicial discipline, such as in party communication. And by the same token, uh, there are matters that are beyond the reach of judicial discipline that are also outside the scope of appeals to various procedural rules. A claim may also be dismissed summarily by the chief judge if it's frivolous, or if the claimed conduct, even if true, would not meet the statutory standard of misconduct or if a limited inquiry by the chief judge establishes that the claim lacks factual foundation. The prior report found some of a reaching disposition for lack of a foundation in fact, with chief judges sometimes dismissing a complaint after informally contacting the judge and the complainant and concluding that the allegation is not supported by the credible weight of evidence. The new rules on the commentary now emphasize what the statute has always provided that a chief judge should not resolve genuine issues of material fact. If the situation is murky, a special committee of judges should be appointed to investigate, and, uh, and, and that is what we are now doing. Uh, this is the procedure in, in a nutshell. The chief judge looks at each complaint and may conduct a limited inquiry into the facts. If the facts are clear and the complaint is dismissible under any of the provided grounds, or if or if corrective action has already been taken by, by the judge, um, then uh, the, uh, the complaint can be dismissed with a written order. And from that written order, the complainant may petition for review before the judicial counsel. But if material facts are reasonably in dispute, in a summary judgment, though it's not exactly the same, or if the allegations are not dismissible under any of the specified grounds, then the chief judge must appoint a special committee to investigate and report to the judicial council. Uh, and that body can conduct further investigation and then either dismiss the complaint or impose various forms uh, of discipline. A complainant or a judge agreed by the council's disposition may petition for review by the judicial conference of the United States in certain circumstances. This, uh, this somewhat globalist description of the mechanisms of proceedings really doesn't do justice to the kinds of substantive questions that are presented. A few scenarios will illustrate the challenging and various issues that have become the subject of procedures that I had just described. Um, a judge uh, reviews something, cuts in front of a movie line, and the way these things sometimes unfold, altercation follows with foul language, or shoving, or worse. Or a judge is addicted to drugs, or is suffering mood-changing side effects of medication, or has passed through rehab for addictions to gambling, or to substances, or to sex. Or a judge doesn't make or can't afford child support payments. Or a judge has a pattern of chronic weakness in deciding motions. A judge is inattentive writing or doodling during proceedings, or sleeping, or being in a fugue state. A 
judge successfully enforces a settlement of a case by threatening to exclude evidence or experts without basis. Or, to take a final example, a judge is arrested for driving while intoxicated or attacking a spouse or inflicting corporal punishment on the judge's job. Dealing with these kinds of matters uh, is, uh, is tough. Fortunately, many of the most common and thorny problems facing uh, a chief judge, habitual delays, mental or physical disability, uh, often related to aging, uh, or problems of temperament are most frequently addressed informally and outside of the complaint process as they always have. That's the state of play. As the Briar Committee uh, recognized, Congress took something of a risk when it opted to deal with possible judicial misconduct by instituting a system that relies for investigation and for the imposition of discipline solely upon judges themselves. The risk is that the system will be tainted by what the Briar Committee called a kind of undue guild favoritism. Now, when the Briar Committee used that phrase, they referred to inappropriate sympathy with the judge's point of view, the accused judge's point of view, thereby for the grace of God to lie. But I think guild favoritism has another component as well. Now, the risk is not simply that the judges on the panel or the chief judge will feel an undue sympathy for the judge as an individual, but that the judges will want to protect the guild, or as I suppose they would put it, the institution. And these risks are omnipresent. Uh, they're at every stage of the uh, process that uh, Judge Jacobs has described, from the chief judge's decision whether to appoint a special committee to the later stages when perhaps misconduct has been found, and the question is what sort of discipline to impose. Now, there are two key safeguards against the guild favoritism that work to reinforce each other. The first is what might be called procedural formality, and the second is visibility or transparency. I'm going to concentrate here on transparency, but I have a couple of thoughts first on procedural formality. Procedural formality is largely in the hands of the circuit chief judge. Judge Jacobs and his fellow chief judges. For example, it means identifying a complaint and initiating the statutory process rather than simply making an informal inquiry and stopping there. It means appointing a special committee rather than disposing of the matter summarily without the procedural and structural uh, safeguards of the special committee process. The major problem identified by the prior committee was the failure of chief judges to initiate proceedings and to appoint special committees in high visibility cases. Now, that doesn't mean that chief judges should have abandoned informal measures, as Judge Jacobs has said, they're very, very important, or that they should not dismiss complaints that are plainly without foundation, as most of them are. What it does mean, I think, is that in close cases, Chief judges should err in the direction of greater formality and greater structure. Because this has two helpful consequences. First, it gets more people involved in the process, so that the decision, particularly if it's a decision to exonerate the judge, is not simply the decision of a single person, a single fellow judge. Second, it has at least the potential for creating a more comprehensive record that will allow the public to intelligently evaluate whether the process has worked as it should. And this brings me to the second of the safeguards, transparency. Transparency actually has quite a few uh, different aspects to it, but I'm going to concentrate here on the most important one, which is telling the public how the judiciary responds when serious accusations are raised about a federal judge. Now, at the risk of some oversimplification, the rules on disclosure can be reduced to four. First, all records of an investigation of alleged misconduct start with a presumption of confidentiality. Second, and at the other end of the spectrum, orders and memoranda of the chief judge and the counsel will be made public, but only when final action has been taken on a complaint and it's no longer subject to review. Third, if the complaint is finally dismissed without the appointment of a special committee, 
the publicly available materials, which included the description of the order, must not disclose the name of the judge without his or her consent. And finally, and this was actually an innovation in those 2008 rules that Judge Jacobs mentioned, in extraordinary circumstances, a chief judge may disclose the existence of a proceeding under the Act when necessary to maintain public, maintain public confidence in the federal judiciary's ability to uh, redress misconduct. Now, overall, these new rules, <coughs> like the old ones, embody a strong presumption against disclosure. Now, the commentary actually has very little to say about the, the justification for that approach. So we can look to the prior illustrative rules, which were somewhat more forthcoming. And those rules refer to and rely on what's called the legislative interest, legislative interest in protecting a judge from the public airing of unfounded charges. Now, even if one accepts the primacy of that interest, and I think some people would debate it, even if one accepts it, I think that the rules go further than is necessary or desirable to promote that interest. I'll give you a couple of examples. It happens that both of them come from the Ninth Circuit, That's not because the Ninth Circuit is a hotbed of misconduct, uh, because I happen to follow that circuit uh, with some greater interest than others, and I just happen to know about these. The first case involves uh, Chief Judge uh, Manuel Rio of the Central District of California. He was accused of improperly intervening in a bankruptcy case to help a woman whose probation he was supervising after she'd been convicted of some uh, fraud offenses. The complaint led to prolonged proceedings that included a published dissent in the Federal Reporter and a televised proceeding in Congress on a resolution of impeachment. Finally, the Chief Judge did appoint a special committee to investigate the, this accusation. The special committee carried out a very thorough investigation. It heard testimony from, I think, 18 witnesses, uh, reviewed thousands of pages of documents. It found that Judge Real had committed misconduct and it recommended the sanction of a public reprimand. In November 2006, the Circuit Council entered an order adopting the findings and recommendations of the Special Committee. But that order was not made public at that time because in accordance with the rules, the Council deferred disclosure until all review within the system had concluded. And that did not happen until January 2008, more than a year later, when the Conduct Committee of the uh, Judicial Conference affirmed the, the order. It was obvious, I think, that delaying disclosure did nothing to serve the interest in protecting judges against the airing of, of unfounded charges. These allegations had already been the subject of a published opinion, televised hearing, uh, they were known. Uh, and what's even worse, adherence to this rule had the perverse effect of delaying the day when the public would see the very thorough and conscientious way in which the judiciary had handled these uh, accusations. And I would say that even if the ultimate decision was that, that he had not committed this time. The other case involves involved District Judge James Payne of Las Vegas. In June 2006, the Los Angeles Times, as part of a series of articles about the, the Nevada judiciary, published a lengthy story accusing Judge Mayen of giving favorable treatment to friends and associates without disclosing his uh, relationships with the, the people who benefited. The story gave a wealth of details, including names, dates, and dollar amounts. The chief judge identified a complaint against Judge Mayen appointed a special committee. That committee, too, carried out a very thorough investigation, it seems to have taken something more than a year, and, find, and submitted a 33-page report, finding that no misconduct had occurred. The Circuit Council reviewed that report, agreed with the conclusion, and dismissed the complaint. So far, nothing special. What's striking is the content of that council order. There are exactly two sentences of explanation. Sentence one says, many of the alleged personal connections were not of the nature or extent alleged. Careful. 
Uh, then the report says the connections that did exist did not reasonably raise questions about impartiality or fairness. That's it. There's no mention at all of any of the details that were included in the time of the story. And most remarkably, the order does not identify the judge. A few weeks later, though, Judge Mayen told his local newspaper about this order, and the newspaper printed a fairly long story saying that Judge Mayen was very heartened by the findings of the investigation, as he might well be. Well, in my view, the policy should be this. When the substance of a pending complaint has become known through reports in mainstream media or through a publication on a responsible website, there should be a presumption, no more than that, but a presumption <coughs> that orders issued by chief judges of circuit councils will be made public as they are issued and with sufficient detail for the public to know what is going on. And of course, in that circumstance, there should also be a presumption that the order will disclose the identity of the judge. In other words, while the current rules are quite acceptable for the routine cases that make up the overwhelming bulk of the misconduct docket, the calculus changes in what the Breyer Committee called the high-profile case. Because by definition, the charges, whether well-grounded or not, have been publicly aired. And in that situation, the interests of the institutional judiciary are best served by disclosure practices that will reassure the public that the complaint is being investigated in a fair and effective way that Congress anticipated. As best I can tell, I have an off button on the seat of my pants that renders me utterly inarticulate if I try to address an audience while sitting down. Uh, and so I'm, I'm going to do this not to, to grandstand, but just because uh, things go very badly if I try to organize my thoughts while seated. Um, this is an organization that loves spirit of debate, and I would, you know, very much enjoy being able to drop a footnote here to the old Saturday Night Live point, counterpoint and point at Arthur and say, Arthur, you ignorant slut. Um, <laughs> In fact, I, I can. I just, you know, just, you know, in the to quote uh, former President Richard Nixon, it would, it would be wrong uh, because I think ultimately I wind up wind up in much the same place uh, as as Arthur does. But what I want to do is step back. I, I think during the question and answer period, uh, I'm happy to roll up my sleeves and talk specifically about uh, some of the hypotheticals or not so hypotheticals that Judge Jacobs talks about and talk specifically about the act. But right now, I'd like to step back and really address the question of why I think this really matters uh, and why it's really important to be talking about uh, right now. For those of us, and I count myself among them, who care about an ind independent judiciary and who worry about the excessiveness of some of the attacks on judges that has uh, been going forward in recent years, it strikes me as critically important that we accept as a trade-off uh, an effective and, for that matter, a robust disciplinary regime. In other words, if we care about whether judges are subject to intimidation and if we are, they're arguing that they need to be independent enough to be removed from that kind of intimidation. They need to be independent enough to avoid it. If we go so far as to say judges need to have the salaries and resources necessary to function as an independent branch, we also need to convince the public that this independence does not translate into unaccountability. Uh, and to that extent, uh, we need to be able to say to them, if judges engage in inappropriate ex parte communication, if they engage in abusive behavior, if they accept improper gifts, they are subject to discipline. Now, the federal courts have been slower than the states to embrace a disciplinary regime. In part, that is because in one particular, they are less independent than the states. In the particular of that, uh, whereas state courts oftentimes have the power to create regulatory regimes for their self-discipline on their own, uh, oftentimes you know, the federal courts are, are beholden to some extent to Congress to get the ball rolling in that regard. To a certain extent also, though, it's because uh, federal judges are more independent. There is some sentiment within the federal judiciary that independence correlates to autonomy. And therefore, there is a certain reluctance to say, OK, if Congress steps in and tells us we've got to discipline our own, and it's OK if judges are out there disciplining each other, uh, that's a little bit worrisome to federal judges. That said, 
The progress has been slower, but it has been steady. And I think it's been steady as a matter of substance and as a matter of procedure. And as a matter of substance, as Judge Jacobs explained, it began in 1939 with the creation of, of circuit judicial councils, which some understood would have a disciplinary role to play. But there was no disciplinary standard to speak of. That didn't really come until 1980, in which you had this relatively general, not just relatively general standard, uh, of conduct that is uh, prejudicial to the effective and expeditious administration of the business of the courts, whatever that means. Right? But over time, the courts began to give it meaning. And over time, they began to become more receptive to the notion that the code of conduct for, for United States judges, which does include a series of ethical, not quite do's and don'ts, they're not quite ready for that. I mean, states have, you know, you shall and you shall not. Those have been stripped out in favor of shoulds and should nots, but still, you still have at more specific ethical standards that judges are becoming more increasingly willing to apply in the context of disciplinary proceedings, which give, put more meat on the bones of the substantive standard. And finally, and as, a, as has been alluded to here, uh, in the most recent rules, you have illustrations of the kinds of substantive behaviors that will violate the, uh, uh, the rule. So we're seeing movement in that direction at a relatively slow but steady rate. As to procedure, you began with this decentralized regime, and I think that that's the only way you could have done it. In 1980, in order to get the buy-in of the federal judiciary, they had been accustomed to regulating themselves on a circuit-by-circuit -circuit basis. Not clear to me that they could have gone in with a national scheme and had it work at that juncture. But the problem with a decentralized regime is that it does give rise to the possibility of patchwork sort of standards for discipline. And so with the new rules, uh, you have in place a greater role for the judicial conference that can hopefully help to normalize those differences to play a more active and centralized role in judicial discipline, which is, again, to say that we see ourselves moving in the right direction. Against this backdrop, uh, the list of recent sort of high-profile uh, disciplinary actions that, that David mentioned at the beginning uh, strike me as really being a good thing in the sense that it is a sign that the disciplinary process is doing what it's supposed to do. You know, in other words, that we've got a lot of judges out there, it is inevitable that a small number will be subject to discipline, and the fact that we are hearing about some of them in that situation is not a bad thing. The problem, of course, is that the public may not see it that way. The public may see this as the tip of the iceberg. And while I've done a lot of work back in the 90s, I had some, uh, <coughs> when I was working for the National Commission on Judicial Discipline and Removal, access to, uh, to chief judges and their records that really wasn't available to the general public, I became convinced that informal discipline worked and worked well. Uh, and that the, there wasn't a lot of things you know, escaping the notice of the judiciary. The problem was, though, that that's not something that necessarily the public is aware of. So they see these examples and say, Lord, if these are the ones I see, what is it that I'm not seeing? And in that regard, I think Arthur's point about visibility is worth taking very seriously. Uh, as to the is issue of procedural formality, I take his point, but I also really appreciate the importance of inform informal dealing with lesser forms of, of, of misconduct, and so I'm not quite sure I'm ready to let go of that yet. But as to the visibility point, the idea that when a complainant bellows from the, the hilltop that he's filed a complaint against a particular judge and the proceeding is going forward, I don't see a downside uh, to making it known that the judiciary is looking into it and to uh, proceeding along the lines that, that Professor Hellman uh, suggests. I realize that this is understandably difficult for the federal judiciary, and I don't think we should be impatient about that. The judiciary is, by its very nature, less transparent than the other branches of government. They are the ones who are up on you know, platforms, dressed in black robes, and physically distanced from the public that they serve. They are the ones who have historically been reluctant to allow for cameras in the courtroom and other sort of transparency devices, and their ethical rules limit what they can say about the cases they're deciding. And there are reasons for these that have been around for a very long time, and I don't need to bore you with them. And they're good reasons. On the other hand, when it comes to the issue of judicial discipline, my point is simply uh, that uh, 
in this particular instance, I think, public confidence in the system. Not just whether the judiciary is disciplining its own, and I believe it is, but public confidence in that system demands a measure of transparency, perhaps more than what the judiciary is currently allowing. With that, I'll subside and, and let the rest of the festivities continue. Uh, would either uh, Judge Jenkins or Professor Helm like to call Professor Jenkins or a slide? After that, we're going to let Judge Jacobs kind of comment on uh, some of the things that he's heard from his colleagues here. Well, like uh, Professor Jay, I have trouble organizing my thoughts while seated. I'm not going to be standing up because that doesn't seem to help. Just <laughs> 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 a few random uh, uh, impressions. Uh, one, the phrase guilt favoritism is an illustration of why it's always a mistake to use a catchy phrase. Um, uh, they're, they're protecting of the guilt uh, to the extent it is protecting the judiciary from um, um, uh, uh, numerous, massive flood of scurrilous uh, allegations is, is not, uh, is not um, um, uh, a, uh, uh, a bad project. The, the purpose of the of these rules uh, is to uh, uh, is uh, to uh, uh, to uh, uh, assure the uh, uh, that conduct prejudicial to the effective and expeditious administration of business of the courts uh, is uh, is suppressed. But the purpose of that is is to assure that the courts have the kind of cachet and prestige that is required in order to get people to voluntarily obey. <coughs> Our orders, and I'm not sure it's altogether helped by a level of uh, uh, visibility or transparency that um, that multiplies uh, uh, the uh, the uh, number of uh, uh, very often frivolous and sometimes quite scandalous allegations that are made against the uh, judges. Uh, one one point I would like to emphasize is that the appointment of a committee which definitely has its virtues, and which I have done, I did it a few weeks ago, uh, imposes a terrible burden on a judge. Uh, one's reputation is at stake. Uh, one would be wise to retain counsel. Counsel is very expensive. They often charge by the hour. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the, the statute does say that if the matter is ultimately disposed of without any discipline being the judge can go to the judicial council. The judicial council may recommend to the administrative office of the courts that the bill, if it's reasonable, to be paid. But there's no, there's no, there's no assurance in that, and it is, it is really very expensive to defend oneself. And uh, if you, uh, uh, and, and and judges, federal judges, and I think all judges are under another severe disability. It's very difficult for them to defend themselves. Uh, uh, and uh, it's difficult for them to defend themselves many times of allegations. Uh, and uh, uh, many of the, of the allegations I see have no, have no support. Uh, uh, they are born in the minds of people who uh, have lost or think that they're losing. You know, it's a phenomenon of judges that they, they pick up enemies over time. And, and some of them fairly not forgiving. I perfectly well understand why people who lose lawsuits or judges uh, or, or lawyers who feel that, uh, that the judges contributed to their loss uh, will, uh, will be very uh, resentful. But uh, if one is to reveal the details of allegations that are ultimately found to be without foundation and name the judge, what sticks, of course, is are the allegations, even if it is said or reported that the allegations have been dismissed by a brother or sister judge. And, uh, and, and this imposes a, a really a terrible burden. It's a financial burden, and it is a, uh, it is a reputational burden, and it has the potential to damage the functioning of the judiciary. And all that said, I still apply the rules, but I think it's fair to do so 
uh, without uh, any a celebrational sense uh, that, uh, that one, is, uh, one is bringing to light um, uh, what, what amounts to 700 uh, complaints uh, against uh, federal judges lodged every year. Uh, many of them lodged by people who are uh, mentally disordered, uh, who, are, who are bitter, or have not read the rules and have the faintest idea what amounts to judicial uh, misconduct. So uh, those are my few uh, the points I can think of for a while. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'd just like to uh, add a couple of uh, comments to that. <coughs> First, I think uh, the area uh, to which there might be a disagreement between Judge Jacobs uh, and me about the proper procedure involves a tiny, tiny fraction of the cases because it is true that the overwhelming majority, probably 90-something percent, are these, uh, are filed by pro se's or pro se prisoners. Um, their, their attempts to relitigate the merits of the case, or they're, they, they're, many of them are, are, are actually delusional. Um, one of the things I think the judiciary can do to reinforce uh, what um, the recognition of that, and it's also a recommendation of the Breyer Committee, is to put the, to make these orders in the routine cases available to the public, so the public would see, without the names of the judges, so the public would see the kind of material, kind of accusations that are being made. That's now being done. It was the first circuit to do it was the Seventh Circuit under Chief Judge Easterbrook. Uh, the next was the Ninth under Chief Judge Kaczynski. The tenth under Chief Judge Henry has followed suit. And I think if all of those orders were available online, but very few people would ever would read them. Um, but people would see first what most of the complaints are, and second they would be reassured that the judiciary is uh, handling them in an effective way. I guess I'll use this forum to encourage uh, Judge Jacobs as uh, one of those chief judges to, uh, to do that. I, I concur with Arthur in the sense that, that I, I think that there are privacy concerns that Judge Jacobs mentioned that cannot be diminished. <coughs> On the other hand, uh, you know, I think that if you operate from the assumption that all else being equal, more speech can be a, a, a remedy uh, rather than less, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, the, the, I think the reality that the vast majority of these are utterly frivolous, which really goes more th further than anything else that I know to reassure me that the judiciary is functioning well, to know that, that most of these are being filed by crackpots, uh, they're being filed by folks who have lost their appeals, and now are, this is, this, they're using this as an alternative to appeal, which is not the point. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I'm, I'm quite comfortable with that, and coming up with a mechanism that allows for that strikes me as being Idea. I'd like to ask Judge Jacobs, within this room, of course, if there are cases where uh, that you have handled in an, in, in an inform, informal way that you wish, in retrospect, had been you handled uh, formally by establishing a committee, and vice versa. No, uh, I think that uh, the the few times that I have worked with a committee, uh, there was no. There was no alternative that was clearly the right thing to do. I think that uh, there, are, there are instances in which uh, informal ways of dealing with things make sense. Uh, what comes to mind uh, is uh, an instance in which a judge uh, made uh, remarks that were uh, uh, ill thought out and uh, unnecessary and uh, uh, were, were deemed to be offensive by a, uh, a prospective juror. As soon as the complaint was made, the judge sent a letter apologizing, and I looked at that letter and I thought, well, that's you know, that's a really that's a stand-up response, and uh, I thought it was very appropriate, and I thought that that took care of the problem. The exception, I think, is in situations where you would potentially misjudge the target judge. In other words, did you think that, it, that the judge would respond favorably to an informal resolution, and the judge says, "I'm a federal judge, go to hell." Uh, and they, they don't say that. <laughs> well, I don't need to say it very often. Uh, but, uh, yeah, but, but there are, I mean, there is, I mean, the, the 19, the National Commission on Judicial Discipline did find isolated examples of that. I mean, it sounds like you have seen them on the Second Circuit. But, but if you're dealing with the exceptionally arrogant judge, um, and I've heard they exist, uh, that, that, you could, that, that, that might be one situation where a formal mechanism was necessary. It's apocryphal. Uh, <laughs> so can I add just one other thing, which is that the, the same act deals with uh, uh, um, allegations of misconduct and also of disability. 
And it is not always clear that the same procedures are, are appropriate for both. And in particular, I, I entirely agree with, with, with Judge Jacobs and uh, Professor Jay that with, with the uh, um, disability uh, situations, the, the confidentiality and the informal methods are absolutely essential. And I know that the National Commission found numerous examples where they had been very successful um, in resolving what could have been extremely painful situations if they had ever become public. So um, I, particularly in the uh, disability setting, I think that's a tremendously important tool. And the, the irony of it is that the more successful it is, the less the public will ever know about it. Because there will simply be nothing in the public record except the fact that perhaps a judge has quietly taken senior staff or has resigned. Yes, or has, has accepted a, a, a reduced caseload that the judge is capable of handling. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and of course, the, the, the point you make is excellent. It's very sensitive. Um, you're more likely to get someone to agree to give up part of their caseload or to retire altogether. Uh, if the, uh, uh, under circumstances in which there's some mental deterioration, if the matter hasn't become public, once it's become public, it, it has become uh, you know, uh, uh, a matter of pride and honor not to, not to uh, lay out your, your, uh, your disabilities or your mental decline for the, uh, for the, uh, for the public. But it's interesting that the disability is a matter so different from this conduct, and yet the rules do treat the two of them um, alike. I have a feeling that the, the matter resolves itself in exactly the way that you have described, Arthur, and that is that when it comes to disability, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the informal methods are much more effective, and the threat of a formal method is totally unacceptable. People simply have to uh, accept uh, the judgment of their peers that they are that they are fair, and of course the judges uh, active in many instances into their 90s. Uh, this is uh, this is a problem that we will see more and more. I'd like to invite anyone up to the microphones to ask questions. Uh, while they're getting there, I'll ask on my own of the entire panel, and that is, are we? making too much of this because of the uh, spate of case, uh, high, rather high profile cases that we've had. Uh, is, it, is the situation any worse today than it was uh, in years past, or is this just a coincidence uh, that we have these cases? Well, I must say, it's been very stimulating hearing all these tidbits about my colleagues. <laughs> uh, there, and there seems to be rather more of it than I, than I um, uh, imagined. Uh, there is a uh, there is a spike. There's a, there is a spike in this. And I think that's. I haven't followed this for a long time because I'm only a chief judge for two years. But my impression, uh, I think those who follow it for a longer time would confirm that that we, we are seeing a spike. Uh, I, another really important reason uh, for this uh, for the salient nature of this art of this issue at this time is uh, is uh, is uh, the interest of Congress and the responses that the judiciary has made to, uh, to initiatives from Congress. Uh, and they, uh, they, uh, they have a lot to say about how we function, and, um, and uh, it's painful when they have valid criticisms and we have response. There's two, yeah, two uh, quick comments on that. One is that this is not the first spike, and there was one, I guess, what was it, in the early 90s when there were several judges who were impeached or uh, convicted of criminal offenses, and then it stopped uh, as, as quickly as it had started. The other is that while I, I, I do think it's, it's happenstance that there are the, this number at this particular time, it may be that the, the handling has been affected by the Breyer Committee report and the congressional pressure is that that Judge Jacobs has referred to, that action has been quicker and more decisive than it would have been in the past when the, 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 uh, the topic was sort of slumbering. I need to get in ahead of Helen just so I'm learning. What do you say? That's, that's all. Yeah. Yes, sir. I gather there's general unanimity among the panelists on uh, two principles, which is that um, those judges who commit infractions 
uh, improper conduct should be disciplined. And those judges who are innocent but attacked uh, should be protected. The problem I found with, and I posed the question to the two professors, with the suggestions of the need for greater visibility and transparency. I heard Professor Hellman say um, that if something comes out in the press or the media, then all the facts should come out. Um, and I asked him as to that remedy, uh, wouldn't that in this day and age of media arranging for leaks uh, just make self-fulfilling whatever disclosure the media wants to obtain or anybody who's going to leak it wants to get the judgment. Um, and I also heard uh, the suggestion made that you should disclose the complaints without names. Uh, in this day and age, is there any doubt that the media would investigate and come up with the ideas as to who the unidentified judge was? And aren't these, and there are other statements made, aren't all of your suggestions just an invitation to make being a judge even more difficult and thus more, less attractive to get those lawyers who we want as judges to accept that sort of um, media uh, transparency? Well, with respect to the second part of the question about the uh, not, uh, I'm satisfied with not naming the, the judges, I'm talking about the overwhelming majority of complaints. I can't imagine that any uh, reporter would want to go through the, the bulk of those complaints and try to figure out which judge is accused of having made a terribly uh, wrong evidentiary ruling in, in a Section 1983 case. The first point, there is something of a risk, but I, I first of all, in all of these disclosure suggestions, I would still leave a great deal of discretion to the chief judges and the circuit councils. Um, but when you have specific allegations, for example, in a newspaper report, as this happened to be a Mayan instance, it seems to me that the specific allegations of that kind in respected newspaper are appropriately the subject of a response in the, the order. Other cases, I think the judges can and should deal with on a case-by-case -case basis. And frankly, one of the odd, one of the uh, other strange things about the spate of uh, uh, misconduct allegations that uh, we've talked about here, probably most people in this audience, and even most people who follow the federal judiciary carefully, were not aware of more than one or two of these. For whatever reason, the press, for the most part, doesn't seem very interested in Cases. So I'm not sure the danger is quite as great as uh, your, your question suggests. I also want to put it in a larger context here. I, I think that, that it, is, it is true that there are going to be some privacy issues that need to be worked out. There are going to be some other issues as to the burdens it imposes on the, on the, the judges under consideration. But, but you also need, at least in my mind, I think of it as the kind of trade-off I spoke about earlier. That, uh, these are judges with life, with, life, with life tenure and with a salary that can't be diminished. It may not be as good a salary as they deserve, but there it is. Uh, and that the trade and they are, that we have organizations out there, uh, you know, fighting for the independence of judges in terms of their right to be free from intimidation, threats of impeachment, threats of jurisdiction stripping, threats of budget cuts, and so on. The trade-off for that is uh, a bit more transparency uh, in support of the proposition that judges are not utterly unaccountable that they are subject to discipline. And it's not enough for us to simply say, trust us, uh, they are subject to discipline. It's informal, we can't tell you about it, and we won't show it to you, but it's there. I'm not sure that that is enough. Uh, and to the extent we're expecting more, I think it is burdensome. I think it is a little, it can be problematic, and we need to have the sensitivity uh, that Judge Jacobs talks about. But that doesn't mean, I think, that the solution is simply to go home and not have it. Uh, I think that's, a, that's not necessarily the right way. As a lapsed uh, member of the old media, I worry about this as we move into a new media era where these these charges will come up in the blogosphere that has a, that far less responsibility about what it 
it uh, prints or puts out there. And I worry about subcontracting the, not the authority, but the, the predisposition to uh, disclose to uh, uh, the blogosphere, talk radio, and, and in fact even, even uh, institutions in the old media, which aren't all that great shakes when it comes to responsibility, as I've noticed. Yes, sir. John Rollins of the Constitution Society. Uh, I'm one of a number of persons who have been involved in the investigation of some of these uh, complaints of judicial misconduct as well as prosecutorial misconduct. And it found generally that the proportion of them that have merit are considerably greater than has been indicated by members of the panel today. The problem with many of those, however, is that the complainant too often fails to distinguish between the misconduct proper and the outcomes that are also adverse to it, and leaving a casual reviewer to think that the only concern was the outcome and to obscure the misconduct that lay behind it. What I would like comments from the panel on today would be a proposal for dealing with the situation that the, because the public has lost confidence in the ability of the, of the legal profession to police itself, not only the judiciary but the lawyers general. And uh, the proposed solution is to have a ch complaints of this conduct heard by a grand jury, which would be a secret. And if the grand jury found that the complaint had merit, they could strip official immunity from the official, could be a judge or anyone else, and have the case referred to a hearing before the ju another jury, a trial jury, on a writ of quo ronto whereby the penalty would be either a injunction against further action that was abusive or removal from, in the case of the federal judge, the assignment tool. So there are remedies that would involve the public as outside interveners, which I think would restore confidence of the public and to deal with the problem more effectively than having members of the profession trying to police one another. Well, just one quick response. Uh, that was the essence of the proposal that was uh, put before the South Dakota voters, the only place I think was uh, and put before the electorate, and the voters themselves overwhelmingly rejected it. And I think the proposal is, is uh, sort of an intensification of the uh, proposal to have an inspector general appointed uh, for the third branch. I understand that the, the, uh, the, uh, the work of that person would consist of reading the 700 complaints and the, uh, and the uh, uh, memo opinions uh, uh, in the main uh, dismissing them. And I often wondered, who would take that job, and uh, what what uh, what they would be like come the weekend? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, returning to the point about trade-offs, I just have some serious concerns about whether the, the concern to the integrity of the judiciary, the independence of the judiciary, uh, would outweigh any benefit that would be achieved by having a different branch of government in effect involved in the uh, in the oversight. Of the <clears throat> My name is Carlos Fair from much maligned Ninth Circuit. <laughs> and uh, what I would like to uh, take advantage of Professor Hellman, Professor Jay, uh, because I know that, that uh, Judge Jacob will recuse himself on this. Um, I would like you to discuss what constitutional limits there is to all this regulation that we're talking about. As I read the Constitution, Article 3 judges serve during good behavior. 
And Article 2, Section 4 says that we can, as federal officers, be impeached for treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. Where does the Congress get off telling us that we can't earn more than 15 percent of our diminished salary, and we cannot go to political dinners or um, take part in politics? Is that really consistent with an originalist or textualist interpretation of the Constitution, taking in view what Jay and other Supreme Court justices did back in the 18th century? Um, where do, I know there's one dissent by Justice Douglas saying that federal judges should not ride herd under the federal judges. What constitutional limitations are there, if any, to the exercise of regulation by A, Congress, and B, other judges? Well, I think you, you kind of begin with a constitutional accident. Uh, which was that originally uh, the plan was for there to be lower federal courts uh, embedded as part of the constitutional structure. And then uh, when that got pulled out by the anti-federalists, there was a compromise put in place that really had nothing to do with congressional power at all. It had to do with uh, Madison's desire to make sure that there was some allowance for lower federal courts. And so the option was exercised to uh, give Congress the right to create them or not. And uh, I think derived from that, that event uh, is the principle that Congress can create and by implication uh, disestablish the federal judiciary and as a result of that regulate them in a variety of ways, affect their jurisdiction, uh, uh, impose such things as, as a, a disqualification rule uh, as part of uh, the business of regulating their administration. Uh, I think the, the, the limitations that uh, still apply are that, that there is still the Article 3, Section 1 judicial power, and you can't step in and, and essentially usurp the judicial power, which is ill-defined, but you know, courts have tried to do that periodically. And then there are other um, due process clause and other, other First Amendment uh, provisions that, that limit congressional power. Uh, but it is, it's still relatively ill-defined. It's, it's essentially Arthur Helms' course on federal jurisdiction to some extent. Well, well, I uh, agree with that description. I think there are endpoints that are pretty easily identified. I and mean, given that, well, the history that uh, Professor Jay has, has summarized, uh, there's a fair amount of um, housekeeping rules that the federal judiciary, that the institutions of the federal judiciary can impose on individual judges. And I don't see that anybody uh, would see an objection to that. So the assignment wheel itself is, is perhaps an example of that. At the other extreme, I think it's equally clear that the judiciary could not do something to a federal judge that was the functional equivalent of removal. Um, that's never been tested, but the cases that have come up have always been gone off on, on other things. But if, if, the, if the judicial council or the judicial conference were to say, you know, this judge we're going to, no more cases will be assigned to this judge. I think that, I, I would hope that would be held to be something that the judiciary could not do that's functionally equivalent to removing the judge, that's only impeachment. But that leaves a huge ground in the middle that has never been resolved authoritatively. There was a case a few years ago involving Judge McBride, the D.C. Circuit avoided that question. I think a three-year suspension was imposed I think that's the most serious that's ever been imposed uh, against a federal judge, but it was over by the time it was litigated. Was that constitutional? I, I have to say, it's an awfully, awfully difficult question, and uh, we don't have an answer yet. Yes, sir. My name is Harry Lewis. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, I was defending a case in state court in which uh, the plaintiff was the chief of a United States Court of Appeals. And uh, he was being represented by a law firm, a uh, very large and powerful law firm in the community that uh, uh, were using extremely, there were a lot of resources clearly being deployed in the lawsuit. Uh, I discovered that the law firm was working for the judge pro bono and uh, wrote a letter, a 
basically asking that uh, he be required to make financial disclosure of the economic value of those services on his financial disclosure forms. Uh, that letter uh, was never responded to or acknowledged in any way. And to this day, I have no idea what disposition was made of that. Uh, and I guess my question to the panel is, is that your apocryphal case, Judge Jacobs? I, the, the plaintiff was the chief judge of the United States Court of Appeals, not you, sir. Yeah, you guys, if you could give me the name of the law firm. <laughs> <laughs> it may still be, you know, this thing may still be under advisement, but, but that might be the apocryphal case you mentioned. So but, I, I mean, I, I, I think that uh, it would be, it's certainly possible to look up to find out whether uh, a gift uh, is, uh, is reported. And I'm not sure I know why uh, one should not accept a, a gift if, if it's reported. If it's not reported, then that's you know, that's some other a technical question. But I, uh, I, you know, I wouldn't. Um, I mean, if there's nothing disreputable about accepting the gift, and, and you report it. And I, I, I don't see a problem at all. The gift did not be reported in this case, at least not as most recent disclosure. Is that the reason yeah. Any more questions? Someone's coming up. Good afternoon. I'm Darrell Wolf from California. Uh, an earlier panel today dealt with uh, the prosecution of public corruption, uh, focusing primarily on the uh, federal statute uh, prohibiting the deprivation of honest services of a public official. And that the uh, first panelist read that statute and said very much as Judge Jenkins did after reading the, uh, the ruling uh, question here, now that I've read the statute, you know what it means. And it was just as hollow to, in that context, as this statute is, or as, as uh, little informative as to what it means. And I'm wondering if uh, there, there's any sentiment among the panel to further define uh, what the rules are here for and they apply to judges because the thrust of the comments at the, the earlier session was it is too general a law to be applied. And I wonder if you have the same problems with applying the, uh, the rule of the question here and if a further definition of uh, what should and should be, what is permissible and what is not permissible uh, would be at all helpful. I, I wrote an opinion saying I did not understand the phrase deprivation of honest services. So I'm, I'm free to say that I still don't understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think sometimes when you're dealing with matters that are this sensitive and that need to respond to different kinds of perceptions and uh, public pressures over time, uh, vagueness uh, has its advantages because vagueness offers opportunities for flexibility. It's a very different question from whether you want vagueness in a criminal statute, or whether you want an incomprehensibility to be built into uh, a criminal statute. So I, uh, I, uh, I suppose I, uh, I briefly satirized the vagueness of the statute involved here. Uh, on the other hand, I think it, it does afford uh, flexibility to develop these doctrines over time in a way that is useful to the judiciary and that serves the public as well. I, I think that, that to some extent, the linking the code of conduct of the United States judges and the standards that it requires uh, it certainly is one way of adding specificity in some context. So, for example, the hypotheticals that uh, uh, Judge Jacobs mentioned at the outset include ones like the judge is well behind in his docket, falling asleep on the bench. There's a code of conduct provision saying the judge shall be diligent. That seems to be uh, an issue. Uh, whether it rises to the level of misconduct would still involve an exercise of, of discretion. Uh, the judge fails to pay uh, court-ordered uh, payments uh, uh, or, or in some ways breaks some other law. The, the code of conduct, at least for the, the ABA model code, says a judge shall follow the law, which means if judges engage in burglary or crimes or any kind, that that is a, another form of, uh, of misconduct. And again, uh, when it's a, a venial sin, you may not want to impose discipline, but it seems to me that, that the code of conduct can, in appropriate circumstances, add a measure of specificity. And now uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Breyer Report and the, and the code of conduct itself uh, do indicate that it, it is a useful
usable device, an interpretive device that can, in some cases, provide that kind of guidance. Now, let me add just one little point to that, which is that now, what, 15 years ago, that the uh, National Commission, Professor Jay mentioned, issued its report, and one of their recommendations was that the judiciary should develop a body of precedents, published precedents, that would fill out the vague contours of the, of the statute. And I'm sorry to say that that has basically not happened. The, the, the cases that have been published and that are available to the, to the public or to the judges generally, there are almost none of them. The Breyer Committee reiterated that recommendation, and uh, even some of these high-profile cases that uh, have occurred in the last year or two still are not officially reported uh, in places where people you would expect to find them. So I think that, that's a very useful way of, 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 do, of, of curing much of the vagueness, recognizing and accepting Judge James' point that is a point beyond which you may not want to go. With that, I'd like to thank our panel.